this time on Crime Inc. New York's Queen of Mean does jail time. The bombs that terrorize London. The changing face of computer crime. Ted Bundy goes to the chair. And Courtney loves years of hell. But first, Russian killers. Hollywood's most chilling serial killer boasted in the film Silence of the Lambs. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. But while the character of Hannibal Lecter came from the fertile imagination of writer Thomas Harris, a cannibalistic killer who murdered and ate up to a hundred women in the Soviet Union really exists. For some reason, the former USSR is the site of some of the world's most gruesome murders, and Nikolai Zhimongoliev committed a number of them. Born in the former Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan in 1952, the killer was terrifyingly known as Metal Fang because of the false teeth he wore made of white metal. Background knowledge is sketchy, but it's believed he was found to be mentally unstable and taken to a psychiatric institution in his early years before bribing his way out and embarking on a deadly rampage. Over a period of several years, possibly beginning in 1980, the Rostov Ripper captured women working the streets and took them home to torture and murder them. He then dismembered their bodies and cooked them up in dishes, which he served his friends and neighbors. One day, friends he invited to dinner noticed a human head and intestines in his refrigerator and panic-stricken called police. Once arrested, Nikolai calmly informed authorities that the bodies of two women provided him enough food for a week. Deemed unfit to stand trial, Nikolai was confined to a secure psychiatric facility in Tashkent, but in 1989 he escaped while being transported to another prison. For more than two years he was on the run, terrifying women around the Soviet Union and probably committing more murders. He was finally apprehended in 1991 in Uzbekistan and taken into custody again until authorities released him into the care of relatives in Eastern Europe. His current whereabouts are unknown. Also unknown is the number of women he murdered, but it's estimated to be between 40 and 100. While police were able to bring Nikolai to justice, unfortunately, this wasn't the case for the victims of a serial killer operating in the Ural city of Pem. In 1995, police announced they were searching for a serial killer who had claimed his seventh victim in less than three months. The police announcement of yet another serial killer at large highlighted the extent to which tales of gruesome deaths had become an everyday part of life in Russia since the end of communist era censorship. Police chief of the Perm region, Valentin Getzen, said the method of killing was consistent with that of a sex maniac. He said police were on full alert and looking for the criminal. The latest victim, a woman, was raped and stabbed in a lift. All the victims were found in the industrial workers district of Perm, Montevalika, and the killer was never identified. The late 80s and early 90s saw a spate of opportunistic murders as killers took advantage of chaos in the legal system to avoid capture while spreading their trails of carnage. One of these men was Andrei Chikatilo, responsible for a huge number of sadistic murders. Chikatilo was born in 1936 after the famines that ravaged the Ukraine. However, this didn't stop him later spinning a story about how he once watched his brother being eaten by starving neighbors during the great grain shortage. Chikatilo's first known murder was in 1978, when he abducted and attempted to rape a nine-year-old girl before stabbing her to death. Another man was executed for the crime, and Andre was free to continue on his murderous way. But as bodies started turning up around the Moscow area, police set up a task force to find the killer. Several mentally disturbed men were savagely questioned by police and confessed under torture, but police were unable to finalize the case. Finally, Chikatilo came to police attention, and he was closely examined and later imprisoned for a year over an unrelated minor robbery. But the forensic evidence didn't stack up, and police couldn't prove the case definitively. Chikatilo eventually left prison and moved on, 
killing another boy while on a business trip to the Ukraine in 1985. Another 10 or more murders followed and police concentrated their search on bus terminals and train stations, the place where Chicatilo often picked up his victims. They soon came across Chicatilo and took him in for questioning after discovering him dirty and disheveled near the site of two bodies. He was treated well and told if he provided evidence that he'd committed the murders, he would be assumed to be sick and would not have to stand trial. Chicatilo believed them and took them to the graves of some of his victims. But authorities had no intention of letting him off that easily. When he came to trial in 1992, he was kept in a wire cage to protect him from his victim's relatives. After a guilty finding, Chicatilo was executed in 1994 after President Yeltsin refused his appeal for clemency. Another murderer who has been kept in a cage for his own safety is serial killer Sergei Rakovsky, who killed about 20 people in the Moscow area between 1988 and 1993. Rakovsky was sentenced to death, which was commuted to life imprisonment when Russia imposed a moratorium on executions in 1996. He will be kept in maximum security for the rest of his natural life. Coming up, computer crime. She was dubbed the Queen of Mean, a billionaire hotel owner who once told a waiter to drop to his knees and beg for his job after he slopped tea into a saucer. The stories of Leona Helmsley's excesses and meanness to staff were legendary. So when the Hotel Queen was charged with fraud and tax evasion, there were plenty of people happy to see her dragged through the courts. Helmsley married her third husband, Harry Helmsley, in 1972, after coming to work for him. She was a self-made millionaire. He had made billions in the hotel business and real estate. It was a match made in heaven, and Leona worked hard to take the family business to even greater heights. The couple's world revolved around the wealthy New York social scene, where they were often seen at premieres and charity events. In 1983, they bought a weekend retreat in Connecticut. The 21-room, $11 million mansion wasn't quite luxurious enough, so they commissioned $8 million worth of renovations. Problem was, they put the bill for the private remodeling through the family company to evade tax, classifying it as business expenses. Foolishly, they also dragged the contractors through the court in an attempt to stall payment. Once the builders got the incriminating invoices, they sent them off to the New York Post, resulting in a huge cover story. The authorities quickly stepped in, and the Helmsleys and two associates were indicted for tax evasion and extortion. However, Harry was pushing 80, and his ill health meant he was assessed as unfit to stand trial. Leona had to take the stand on her own. The case was a media circus, with the press delighting in the sordid revelations that came out in court. Employee after employee came forward to testify to Leona's spiteful temper and disdain for those poorer than herself. The critical testimony came from Elizabeth Bohm, the former housekeeper, who told the court that when she had remarked that her employer must pay a lot of tax, Elmsley replied, we don't pay taxes. Only the little people pay taxes. As well as the renovation fraud, Leona was charged with writing off items ranging from underwear, a $130,000 stereo system, and a million dollar swimming pool cover as business expenses. The trial is about uh, an unbridled lust for power and greed. Leona was found guilty of defrauding the United States government of $1.2 million in taxes and sentenced to 16 years in prison, a term that was reduced to four years under appeal. She was also fined $7.1 million. The disgraced businesswoman was released after serving 18 months, but her reputation was in tatters and she became a virtual recluse. In 1997, her husband died, leaving her his $5 billion fortune. The emotion and ill will caused by the court case left her wary of trusting anyone, and she lavished all her devotion on her Maltese dog, Trouble. 
but New Yorkers had no sympathy for the fallen queen of Amin. I think she got what she deserved. It doesn't seem long enough. Leona died in 2007, leaving $12 million in trust for her dog. In 1994, a mysterious bomber embarked on a reign of terror, setting off 36 devices in Barclays Bank branches and Sainsbury supermarkets across London over a period of five years. The only clue left by the bomber was a picture from the film Reservoir Dogs, with Welcome to the Mardi Gras Experience printed across it. I was in a travel shop next door to the Barclays Bank, just making inquiries about holidays. And I heard this bang, and I thought that it was nothing to be worried about. I thought it was a car backfiring or a bus backfiring. Um, about 10 or 15 minutes later, a policeman came in and said, everybody stay in the shop. They were calling in off the air because an explosive device had gone off. The huge police operation was mounted to catch the Mardi Gras bomber, but he eluded them for years. The attacks mounted up, and several people were injured. It wasn't until the bomber attempted to cash in on his notoriety and demanded cash from Sainsbury's that police were able to bait a trap. They arrested 61-year-old Edgar Pierce and his brother Ronald after an extensive surveillance operation. At his trial, Edgar was found to have carried out the bombings alone and was sentenced to 21 years behind bars. Ronald was convicted of possessing a stun gun and sent to jail for a year. Police believe Edgar's motive was greed and desire for detention. When they raided his house, they found a stash of weapons and many photos of women shoppers. Edgar's defense argued in court that their clients suffered from Binswanger's disease, a form of dementia. He's a hero in the eyes of some, a common criminal to others. Kevin Mitnick had authorities on edge during the early days of the internet when, as an anonymous hacker, he exploited security loopholes to gain access to some of the most sensitive information systems in the world. He's alleged to have snuck into FBI and Pentagon computers, although these organizations refused to confirm this. When the FBI finally tracked him down, he was charged with wire fraud and illegal possession of computer files stolen from companies including Motorola and Sun Microsystems. Mitnick embarked on his shady deeds in cyberspace as a teenager in the late 70s. It was a time of excitement and experimentation for computer geeks. Many companies had no idea of the risks posed by internet access, and their systems were ripe for the picking. Mitnick led police on a two and a half year chase that resulted in what the US assistant district attorney labeled a countrywide hacking spree. He was captured in 1995 and served five years in a federal prison. Hacking for fun has been the norm up till now, but with more companies joining the internet, it's becoming a situation of profit for gain, hacking for gain. Uh, industrial espionage via the internet is going to become a major concern over the next few years. Mitnick and his hacker friends were not interested in making money out of their exploits. For them, it was the thrill of the chase and the challenge of cracking government and industry's most sensitive systems. But since then, the internet has become the world's most powerful communication tool. The security risk posed by a small number of experts has become much more intense as millions of people log on to the World Wide Web. Since his release from prison, Mitnick has put his skills to good use as a security consultant, a profession that has become an essential resource for companies doing business on the web. Unfortunately, experts say people have been slow to realize the risk they face from internet criminals whose motivation is simply greed. Today's computer con artists send out millions of spam emails to try and lure unwary recipients into giving out their financial details. The use of spyware that secretly installs itself on your computer and gives hackers unauthorized access is also on the increase. One of the reasons for that, of course, is the attackers are increasingly trying to use our machines to attack others. Extortion, spammers, adware, spyware, they're just some of the many examples of how they're using these compromised machines today. 
Experts warn that the rise in popularity of internet-enabled cell phones means users need to protect their information even more carefully. We look at this as being a future area. If you've got a smartphone, you should certainly consider the type of information you're storing in that smartphone, the type of e-commerce transactions, and consider getting security protection, also maintaining patches and also password protection. Worms are increasingly invading next-generation phones, PDAs, and other mobile devices that have email and web browsers. Internet security firm Symantec predicts that future attacks on computers and phones will come embedded in audio and video images and that the use of adware and spyware will increase. Security breaches are estimated to cost British businesses 10 billion pounds a year. So information security has become big business with thousands of pieces of malicious code making their way through the world's computer networks. It's never been more important for businesses to secure their information. Coming up, Ted Bundy, the face of evil. Good-looking, smooth-talking, and a high achiever, Theodore Ted Bundy gave family and friends no hint of the depravity that lurked under his wholesome facade. The law student who volunteered on the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee and worked for the Republican Party raped and murdered more than 30 women during a rampage that lasted four years and spanned several states. But it wasn't until he moved on to Utah and Colorado where he killed several more women that Bundy was finally taken into custody. However, he escaped twice, and a second time slipped the net and reached Florida, where he murdered two women at Florida State University. His final victim was 12-year-old Kimberly Leach. Bundy was on his way out of Florida when he was pulled over by police for driving a stolen Volkswagen. This time, there was no escape. The officer recognized him as one of the FBI's most wanted criminals, and he was taken to Tallahassee to stand trial for his latest crimes. As a law student, Bundy insisted on defending himself and reveled in the attention. He pleaded not guilty, but was convicted on the basis of witness testimony and identification of bite marks left on the victim's bodies. Sentenced to death, Bundy spent 10 years appealing the judgment before cooperating with police on where some of his victims were buried but he refused to talk of himself as a murderer in the first person, referring to his savage side as the entity. When he first walked in the chamber, he looked, uh, I would say, very, very shaken. He sat down, regained his composure, and then when they put the chin strap on him after the statement, he, his eyes just really lit up. He became very scared, and, uh, and at that point, it was basically over. Bundy finally went to the chair on January the 24th, 1989, to the cheers of people waiting outside the prison. In her 2006 memoir, Dirty Blonde, The Diaries of Courtney Love, the author writes, I've scrubbed clean the mud and rags of 2000 to 2005, five years of hell. And as she steps out for media engagements these days, it certainly does seem that the rock musician has finally won the battle with drugs that saw her in and out of court for five years. The suicide of Love's rock star husband, Nirvana lead singer Kurt Cobain in 1994 hit her hard and her illegal drug use spiraled out of control. In 2003, Love hit the headlines when California police arrested her for felony drug possession. When she arrived at court, the tabloid press saw her as fair game, and one reporter provoked her by asking if she'd had her husband murdered. Love was arrested after police caught her breaking windows at a boyfriend's Los Angeles home in the middle of the night. Hours later, she was rushed to hospital for what was described as a medical emergency. Love temporarily lost custody over her 11-year-old daughter, Frances Bean Cobain, after her arrest. She pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor charge of being under the influence and was sentenced to a drug rehabilitation program. But before long, Love was back before a judge, accused of assaulting a woman who was sleeping on a couch at her boyfriend's house. The court gave Love the opportunity to mend her ways and placed her on probation. The musician also continued to write and record music, releasing a critically acclaimed solo album and touring with her band. But behind the scenes, her life was unraveling. 
A cocaine addiction distracted her from her financial affairs, and she mysteriously lost millions of dollars from her investments, a case still being investigated by the FBI. Love said she believes people close to her were involved, and that they did it because they thought she was close to death. But by January 2005, Love had regained custody of her teenage daughter, although she still had to front up to court where she pleaded no contest to the misdemeanor assault charge and guilty in a case involving a forged prescription. The following month, Love was back in court, admitting that she violated her probation by taking drugs again. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Rand Rubin told the 41-year-old celebrity that he was very disappointed in her actions and had planned to send her to jail before attorneys convinced him she should enter a chemical dependency center instead. He sentenced her to 180 days in custody for violating her probation in three criminal cases. The judge also warned Love her behavior was not something to joke about. A comment possibly provoked by Love's appearance on a comedy central roast for Pamela Anderson, where she sent up her sobriety. The previous year, Love had made an infamous appearance on David Letterman's talk show, where she bared her breasts and talked in such a rambling way that Letterman had to bring the interview to a premature close. That night, she was arrested at a gig for tossing a microphone stand into the crowd and injuring a fan. I, I do want you to know that I am very disappointed. I have read all of the reports. I know the statements you made. I understand that drug addiction is a disease. I can't force you to be successful in getting off drugs. Uh, your lawyers can't be, force you to get off drugs. Three courts have tried now to help you get off drugs. And I am disappointed because you're not clean and sober, okay? And it certainly is not something to joke about. My belief was that you need to go to the county jail. And I really planned on taking you in today because I think that you need to hit rock bottom before you make a decision what you're going to do in the future. I think you either need a long-term drug program or a long-term in the county jail. That's what I believe. Thank you. Good luck, ma'am. It was the wake-up call Love needed. She spent a month in a drug treatment facility and was back in front of Judge Rubin three months later. But this time, the judge was praising her progress. I have was here for a progress report today, and I have reviewed the reports, and you've done really well. I'm really pleased with the reports. Pleased with the progress you've shown, and uh, I have reviewed all of the requests of the doctors of the chemical dependency program, and uh, I've discussed this with all of the attorneys in the matter. Uh, I am going to make the remaining 60 days of the chemical dependency program to, in fact, be served as an outpatient program, not to be out of the house past 10 o'clock p.m. And all other terms and conditions of the probation and the two DEJ matters will remain in full force in effect. Reuben placed several conditions on Love's release from the live-in program. They included random checks twice a week for drug and alcohol, staying out of places where alcohol was the chief item of sale, and a 10 p.m. curfew. She was also ordered to continue counseling and therapy. In the years since, Love has recorded another album, consolidated her finances, and pursued an acting career. She seems to have put the five years of hell well behind her.
of life in Russia since the end of communist-era censorship. Police chief of the Perm region, Valentin Getzen, said the method of killing was consistent with that of a sex maniac. He said police were on full alert and looking for the criminal. The latest victim, a woman, was raped and stabbed in a lift. All the victims were found in the industrial workers' district of Perm, Montevalika, and the killer was never identified. The late 80s and early 90s saw a spate of opportunistic murders as killers took advantage of chaos in the legal system to avoid capture while spreading their trails of carnage. One of these men was Andrei Chikatilo, responsible for a huge number of sadistic murders. Chikatilo was born in 1936 after the famines that ravaged the Ukraine. However, this didn't stop him later spinning a story about how he once watched his brother being eaten by starving neighbors during the great grain shortage. Chikatilo's first known murder was in 1978, when he abducted and attempted to rape a nine-year-old girl before stabbing her to death. Another man was executed. This time on Crime Inc. New York's Queen of Mean does jail time. The bombs that terrorize London. The changing face of computer crime. Ted Bundy goes to the chair. And Courtney loves years of hell. But first, Russian killers. Hollywood's most chilling serial killer boasted in the film Silence of the Lambs. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. But while the character of Hannibal Lecter came from the fertile imagination of writer Thomas Harris, a cannibalistic killer who murdered and ate up to a hundred women in the Soviet Union really exists. For some reason, the former USSR is the site of some of the world's most gruesome murders and Nikolai Zhemongoliev committed a number of them. Born in the former Soviet Republic of Kazakhstan in 1952, the killer was terrifyingly known as Metal Fang because of the false teeth he wore made of white metal. Background knowledge is sketchy, but it's believed he was found to be mentally unstable and taken to a psychiatric institution in his early years before bribing his way out and embarking on a deadly rampage. Over a period of several years, possibly beginning in 1980, the Rostov Ripper captured women working the streets and took them home to torture and murder them. He then dismembered their bodies and cooked them up in dishes, which he served his friends and neighbors. One day, friends he invited to dinner noticed a human head and intestines in his refrigerator and panic-stricken called police. Once arrested, Nikolai calmly informed authorities that the bodies of two women provided him enough food for a week. Deemed unfit to stand trial, Nikolai was confined to a secure psychiatric facility in Tashkent, but in 1989 he escaped while being transported to another prison. For more than two years he was on the run, terrifying women around the Soviet Union and probably committing more murders. He was finally apprehended in 1991 in Uzbekistan and taken into custody again until authorities released him into the care of relatives in Eastern Europe. His current whereabouts are unknown. Also unknown is the number of women he murdered, but it's estimated to be between 40 and 100. While police were able to bring Nikolai to justice, unfortunately, this wasn't the case for the victims of a serial killer operating in the Ural city of Perm. In 1995, police announced they were searching for a serial killer who had claimed his seventh victim in less than three months. The police announcement of yet another serial killer at large highlighted the extent to which tales of gruesome deaths had become an everyday part for the crime, and Andre was free to continue on his murderous way. But as bodies started turning up around the Moscow area, police set up a task force to find the killer. Several mentally disturbed men were savagely questioned by police and confessed under torture, but police were unable to finalize the case. Finally, Chikatilo came to police attention, 
and he was closely examined and later imprisoned for a year over an unrelated minor robbery. But the forensic evidence didn't stack up and police couldn't prove the case definitively. Chicatilo eventually left prison and moved on, killing another boy while on a business trip to the Ukraine in 1985. Another 10 or more murders followed and police concentrated their search on bus terminals and train stations, the place where Chicatilo often picked up his victims. They soon came across Chicatilo and took him in for questioning after discovering him dirty and disheveled near the site of two bodies. He was treated well and told if he provided evidence that he'd committed the murders, he would be assumed to be sick and would not have to stand trial. 